Kia ora everyone and welcome to another episode of the Smith & Heston podcast. I'm Laura McGoldrick. Cricket is happening, it has been happening. I'm sure like me you've been staying up late watching the IPL which has concluded. I am joined now by Ian Smith and Mike Hesson who has just recently touched down in New Zealand. Hess, I'll start with you. Uh, welcome home. How does it feel to be back? That is a long tournament with 10 teams in it. Yeah, it certainly is, Laura. Uh, 74 games across, obviously, a couple of months. Um, and then the, the two months prior to that with the auction and so forth. So certainly lovely to, to land back in New Zealand and, and reacquaint myself with my family and my dog. So that's nice. And, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm staying awake, which is good. My first, uh, my first full day today oh. back in the country. Well, you look, you look ravishing. You look, you look younger, if, oh, if that you. was even possible. Um, Smithy, you also look ravishing. How did you enjoy the IPL as a tournament? Did you watch much of it? Well, I just completely was blown away by the introduction of the new franchises and just how successful they became, Laura, right from the outset. Um, I, I was impressed, uh, I think, uh, with the newcomers. I, I look at some of the, uh, the older established guys uh, who weren't really in the running this time around. I look at Stephen Smith's uh, NI Super Kings, uh, Brendan McCullum's uh, Colt Pack AR were, were zero thereabouts, but we're coming quite a long way out. So I think for the sake of the competition, the introduction of the new franchises, uh, the odd new player on the scene, I, I think was um, quite a revelation to see that, that it can be done and can be done quickly. We move on to the test matches which are happening, uh, uh, you know, over in England, which is hugely exciting. But it's not the test matches I think New Zealand at the start of the year thought they were going to set out to play. Playing against Brendan McCullum's side now, and that's something that's going to take us all a little while to get used to. Brendan McCullum being the test coach for England, uh, that appointment just happening only recently. Do you think here Scary Stead has lost a little bit of sleep about this? I know that England are probably the team, the underdogs going into to this series against New Zealand, but... Brendan McCullum brings a whole different attitude, a different way about the way he plays cricket and certainly test cricket. Do you think Gary Stead's affected by that big change they made ahead of the series? Well, I think if they didn't make a change, then it's pretty much status quo and you know what you're going to come across. So from a planning perspective, it's pretty easy. I mean, I guess with Brendan, it is going to take time. And I think that that's something that, um, you know, he and his fans are going to have to understand. And you can pretty much tell by the selection of that first side that it, from a batting point of view, it's relatively status quo. Um, you know, Ollie Pope will move up to three, which is a big shift, but they've obviously identified that they don't have another quality top-order player. Um, they've got plenty of good middle-order ones, uh, but they obviously can't fit them all in. And uh, and if they want Joe Root to bat at four, then, you know, Brendan and his crew have obviously picked Ollie Pope as the, as the guy who's going to have to be able to step up there. Obviously brought James Anderson and Stuart Broad back, and without doubt, Gary Stead will be thinking... Uh, he knows what he's going to get there, and he's going to get two highly professional opening bowlers with the Duke's ball, and they will be challenging for any touring side. And you know, we saw New Zealand's top order uh, in the latest warm-up game struggle uh, against Porter, who's a you know once again a, a medium pacer but really good control of swing and seam, uh, and he challenged that top order. So I'm sure, you know, from a batting point of view, heading to Lords, uh, if you get chucked in, you know, Stuart Broad and, and Anderson are going to certainly ask questions that the New Zealand top order are going to have to answer pretty emphatically in those first sort of few hours. But, look, Brendan McCullum will bring self-belief, no doubt about that. Um, you know, there's a lot of talk about he'll bring this aggressive style. I mean, I think he'll bring a, a positive approach. Um, I think you've got to, you've got to work within the, the players that you have. And as I said, to, to build that, that really positive style of play is going to take time. Um, firstly, he's got to get to know his players. They've got to start to trust him. They've got to... Um, start to understand that selection is aligned with that as well. Um, and that'll be a big challenge for Brendan in terms of how much say he will have around selection. Um, you know, whether he watches a lot of county cricket um, or he's got people around him that he trusts. So that, that sort of first six months in the job is going to be critical. Um, but no doubt uh, New Zealand will, will be challenged in this series, as they always are, but I still think they should be favourites. Ian Smith, I'd love your uh, thoughts on Brenna McCullum taking over that role because, similar to Australia, really, I think particularly with the test matches or the test team, it's a very high-profile job. It's uh, heavily criticised if things were to go bad. How do you think a bloke who you've watched play a lot of cricket over the years and then you've worked with him in the media as well, how do you think Brenna McCullum is fit for this job? Do you think he was the right decision for England to make? Well, no, Brenna McCullum, he thrives on a challenge. And this is certainly a challenge. Uh, we looked at them in the Ashes and we thought uh, a pretty pathetic bunch, really. 
you know, so far behind Australia, it didn't matter on a daily basis. So it's got a lot of work to do. Uh, and he'll love that. I like the way he said uh, when people thought that might be the white ball job he went for, he said, what can I achieve there? What, you know, what's the benefit there? Uh, the world champions at the moment, uh, their situation is pretty much under control there. There's no work to be done, but there's work to be done, and that, I think that sums up Brendan McCullum. Uh, Mike makes a good point. Um, he will bring a positive attitude, but I think initially it'll be quite a cautious positive. He won't charge through the door and say, this is how we're going to play it. That's not the way that English county, uh, English test teams are set up. Captain is the captain in those particular environments. So he'll be a great support for Ben Stokes. Uh, look, in terms of uh, county players and talent, Brennan won't know anything about them. Uh, he wouldn't have watched any county cricket. I doubt whether they might before he took this job and he was even looking at county scores. But it wouldn't have worried him because he wouldn't have thought initially he was going to be involved with that. His biggest priority, as we well know, that in the form of cricket, and test cricket in particular, your biggest asset are runs on the bank. Runs in the bank. And that's what they could not get in Australia. His biggest priority is to find a top three. OK, you can have uh, root at number four, but it's still no good if they're going to be two for 20 more, more often than not. He has to find a top three. He has to find solid openers and a solid number three, and that is his first mission. When he does that, and then you are 100 for lunch, 100 for one at lunch, or 150 for two at tea, it'll be surprising how much easier the game becomes for them. We're looking at the at the captains right now, and we look at England's captains' his first Test Series as captain Ben Stokes in his new role, working with Brendan McCullum. What do you think Brendan McCullum uh, will be saying to Ben Stokes as captain ahead of this first Test match? Yes, given you know him so well. As, as a captain, you were his coach, obviously. What do you think that uh, Brendan McCullum will be saying to Ben Stokes? I think he'll encourage him to trust his instincts. Um, I think Ben Stokes, he won't be your traditional English captain. I think he'll, uh, you know, he'll have his own thoughts and his own style around how he wants to play the game. And I think the coach's job is to, as I said, to encourage that, help him thrive, give him as much um, as much off the field um, feedback that's required. Once he gets to know Ben, he'll start to work out how that feedback needs to be provided. You know, whether he's a, a visual sort of a guy, whether it's a matter of sitting down in the changing room afterwards and giving him some thoughts, whether it's showing videos, whatever it is, they need to find a method where they can uh, they can start to share ideas in a an unthreatening manner, you know, so that Ben Stokes trusts Brendan. Um, obviously, you know, whether they, they like messages being sent out on the field, whether they don't, whether they want to, you know, leave them for the drinks break or leave them for breaks, um, whether, you know, Brendan needs to, to work with Ben around creating a senior leadership group so that out in the middle, Ben's got some um, some guys to talk to. Obviously, he's great mates with Joe Root anyway, and, and they work together um, in the opposite order previously. Um, but whether Joe's you know willing to help contribute in that space, uh, what role Jimmy Anderson or, or Stuart Broad has to play, you know, I, I think you always need a, a leader of that bowling group and somebody that's going to work with the younger guys. So um, and help Ben. So. You know, there's a, there's a big job there for the coach just to make sure that when they're out in the park, Ben's got the support that he needs. And uh, and as I said, enough ideas coming, but not too many. I see Brendan working with um, with Ben Stokes as a partnership. I don't, as I said before, I don't see him trying to gazump him. Uh, he won't want headlines, Brendan McCullum. But what he will do if he does the job right, he'll be alongside Ben Stokes very quickly when he needs to be. Uh, and and that environment, the English media, is a place where you have to look after your captain, you have to manage your captain well, and there'll be times when I think you'll find Brendan McCullum will do that. He's pretty good at handling that side of the job. Oh, yes, and Hesno, you know that too, all too well. You know, when he was captain, he'd come out and there was no man that would fight louder and greater for his players. Once he selected them, that's it. We saw Joss Butler in the IPL really set it alight. He was unbelievable. The man couldn't stop scoring runs. It was almost embar embarrassing. But do you see him making a push for a test comeback? Because they talked about him not having a place for him. Um, someone like Brendan McCullum and Joss is another team that I see working within the team. Look, he's, a, he's hard to leave out. I mean, he's such a high-quality player. I know he's been tried uh, with the red ball. He's been tried with the gloves. Uh, ben Folks has obviously got the job at the moment. Uh, and as I said, initially, Brendan's come in, and it's pretty much status quo. He's pretty much said, OK, selectors, I'll, I'll back your judgment. Uh, I'll work with this group, and, I, and then I'll start to form my own views. So, uh, But I'm sure Josh Butler in the background will be just, you know, in the, in the back of Brendan's mind going, look, I love this type of cricketer. I love this guy that can change a game within the period of a, uh, of a session, potentially even an hour, um, if he's got that freedom to be able to do that. 
But the only way he can do that is if he gets his top three sorted. And that's that's the key. And, and that's where I, I really – I look at the Joe Root decision to put him at four, and, and sure, it might be the best thing for Joe Root. But when you've got, um, you know, the likes of Bearstow, as I said um, – you know, you've got you've got so many middle order players. You've obviously got to fit Ben Stokes in there. Um, you've got Ollie Pope, who's this up and coming player. You've got Harry Brook, who's a, the next big thing. All of these guys all bat four to six, four to seven. Um, and Joe Root is your best player, who still could perform at three uh, and allows you the quality batting lineup to improve. I tell you what, that's a discussion that I'd definitely be having because you go through county cricket at the moment, and, and to be fair, most of the guys scoring runs are overseas players at the top of the order. Uh, the likes of Rizwan and um, uh, Pajara has scored, scored plenty as well. So from a, an English point of view, that top order, they get that sorted, then you have the luxury of thinking about someone like a Joss Butler um, because you have him coming in at seven on a test side. Uh, ben Folks hasn't certainly shot the lights out yet. He didn't keep very well on the last tour either uh, where they really needed him. So he, you know he's in there as the best keeper. Uh, so I'm sure Josh Butler will continue to be in the back of Brendan's mind. New Zealand have some selection. I'm headaches, I guess you'd say. Henry Nichols still hasn't recovered from that calf. Looking likely that we'll see Michael Brace will make his test debut at Lords. Trent Bolt coming in from the IPL final. Uh, it's looking likely he will not feature in that first test match at Lords, which I know he'll be disappointed at because it's always such a privilege to play somewhere like like Lords test. But where do you imagine, or do you imagine, us at any point seeing AJ's Patel feature, Matt Henry? What do you think? The, the makeup of the New Zealand team will be? Yeah, look, I think uh, for me, Mitchell comes in for, for Nichols at five um, if he's not fit. I mean, I think he's a he's a straight swap there. Um, obviously, Blundell at six. We've sort of top, talked through the top the top four. I mean, it, for me, it's there's two decisions. It's either de Gronholm or Henry um, or it's uh, AJs Patel and Henry because I think Jameson, uh, Southey and Wagner are, are a lock-in. Um, and it's just whether they want that sort of more seam bowling of, of de Gronholm at seven and that bit of extra batting, or they want to go with uh, Matt Henry, who with the Dukes ball uh, has been exceptional uh, and obviously finished the, the season particularly well for the Black Caps as well. But I, I think you need to go in uh, to a Lord's Test with a spinner, personally. Um, I think that mm. you need to be able to hold up one end at times when it does get flat. Uh, the ball still holds with the Duke's ball. I mean, we talk about the Duke swinging and seaming. Uh, it's also pretty good for spinners too. Uh, it's got a really pronounced seam. It does bounce. It does turn. Um, I think of, you know, Bruce Martin performed really nicely there uh, before he got injured. And, um, Mo and Ali always does well there in terms of the bounce and turn that he gets. AJs Patel is in, in prime form. Um, he's bowled nicely in, in both warm-up games. Uh, so, I mean, I don't think they can go in with the five seamers, which you can in New Zealand. I think you really do need to play AJs Patel. Therefore, for me, it comes down to either de Gronholm or Henry. Um, and obviously, without Bolt playing the first test, uh, that's probably the only decision, really. So, um, yeah, look, it's, a, it's nice to have options. Um, and Daryl Mitchell obviously got a 50-odd in the first innings and probably secured that spot at five, which means the, the loss of Henry Nichols may be not quite as big as it, as it could have been. What do you think about that, Smithy? You'd like to see AJs play at Lords? Absolutely. Uh, there's the thing called a slope at Lords. Uh, the Middlesex, uh, you know, who uh, that's their home. They've always had good spinners. Uh, you know, they they use the slope uh, to their advantage, and and that's a big factor. It doesn't need to turn a lot. You can, it doesn't matter which end you bowl with with the slope either, because you can get the ball turning or drifting in down the slope and turning away up the hill. It, it, it happens, particularly as the match wears on. You simply cannot go into a Lords Test match without a spinner. AJ Patel is an absolute must for me. The big one for me uh, is w where is Kyle Jamieson at here? Uh, look, I, I hope he's good because bounce bowlers also, when they've got a bit of slope, are hugely effective at Lords. The big, tall guys who can get it to bounce off the length, hit the hard, you know, the hard the hands, uh, get around the shoulder of the bat, those guys are invaluable. Now, Kyle, uh, of course, Kyle Jamieson, during uh, the last time he played in English conditions, to my reckoning, was the World Tam Test Championship final. He was brilliant, absolutely brilliant. Uh, and if he's anywhere near that again, New Zealand have a great asset. I think he's a huge key. Uh, I think Saudi will bowl well. He, he's a, a man for the big occasions. He will do a good job. Whilst they're waiting um, for uh, Trent Bolt to arrive, I agree with Hess. If they went with Matt Henry, I would not be disappointed whatsoever. 
his form for Kent when he played for them was simply outstanding. He was a front runner because he knows how to use English conditions as well. You've got to, when you go uh, to places like Lords, uh, sure, there's the history, there's the romance about it, but there are little bits about um, the conditions that England will use. And when you're experienced enough to go back there, you've got to use them yourself. Jameson, a big factor for me, to tell a definite starter. You haven't factored in lunch. I always heard that the Lord's lunch was the best on the circuit, like the quite quite extraordinary, the meals you get at, at Lord's Hess. I see you nodding. You know what I'm talking about. What are your predictions uh, for this Test Series? Uh, look, I think we're favourites. Uh, I think we should be. I think, um, you know, it's how our New Zealand's top order deals with Anderson and Broad, I think, will dictate the outcome of the of the series. And, uh, you know, we, we performed pretty well last time we were over there. Um, and, you know, we've got a pretty experienced group there now um, in terms of those, you know, that top that top four in particular. I know Conway's new, but obviously he got a double hundred there uh, in his first test in the UK last time. Uh, you know, it's an experienced top order. Will Young's played a lot of county cricket recently. He's been in good touch, uh, scored 100 early on in his first county outing of the year. So um, all of these things are good signs. I mean, your top four have got to set the platform. If they do that, then we've got plenty of power through the middle. Uh, if we do go with uh, with Matt Henry instead of DeGronholm, then obviously Jamieson's got to step up at seven with the bat. And I think he's always got to get there in, at some stage during his career. So I think now is probably the time to do it. Um, you know, if he comes in at seven, he's going to have to take some responsibility there from a batting point of view. Um, and I don't think that's a bad thing. Uh, and I think if New Zealand's bowling lineup can attack the, the top three of England, as I said, that middle order is definitely more suited to playing against a 40-50 over ball. So I would back us um, to apply pr plenty of pressure and I would expect Ajaz Patel to be um, an important member throughout the series. Smithy, what are your predictions? Do you think New Zealand have this series? Oh, I think we should be favourites, but I'm not sure we will be. Um, I haven't seen a market for it. I, I don't know what the, uh, the various betting agencies are, are framing it as, and I know they'll be heavily into it in England with Ladbrokes and whatever. Um, but I, I, there is a big uh, mitigating factor about our favouritism, and that is I, I just wonder a wee bit whether we might have just gone slightly over the crest. Those two results at home, those losses at home, were quite damaging in terms of the World Test Championship. So I, I wonder about that. Uh, and the other thing is that England at home, uh, I, I think, are always uh, a really tough proposition, no matter uh, who they bring in or what kind of form they've got. They'll be looking. This is a really clean slate they've wiped here. They've put a big broom through their system uh, right from the, you know the, the top when you get a guy like Rob Key coming in to sacrifice a commentary career. Uh, you appoint a leader like Stokes um, and a, a, a Botham type leader uh, haven't, hasn't often worked in the past. And then, of course, you bring in a, a real wild card in Brendan McCullum. But I, I think that, that kind of trio in itself deserves respect for their knowledge of the game and the way they want to play the game. That makes them dangerous. Pretty even for me. I think I'll keep keeping my money in my pocket. But, Laura, for me, that's quite a rare thing. Well, <laughs> that's true, actually. You shouted me dinner during the, the women's cricket. Workout. Um, I did see, though, so obviously this is the, the, the first test match at Lords is the Queen's Jubilee Test, so it's, there's, a, there's a lot on it, you know, tradition-wise. It's very special. Still today, 22,000 tickets haven't sold. So the fans, they're a bit mm, not sure how we feel about that, that England test team at the moment, which is, which is an interesting one to watch to see if the crowds grow during the series. Um, some other talking points from around the world um, at the moment well, actually right here in our very own backyard is the White Ferns. They've had, well, their, their, their own clean out, in fact. David White and Brian Stronach uh, have decided that there will be no contract for Amy Satterthwaite, Leah Tahuhu and Frankie Mackay. So the Canterbury duo miss out uh, there and there are some new faces uh, in the contract list there. And I personally was quite surprised, particularly with Amy Satterthwaite. Um, her last game internationally um, would be in the World Cup when they played against Pakistan at Hagley Oval, saw her get a duck, and she didn't know that was going to be her last game for New Zealand. And I was really sad for her that that's the way she went out and didn't get to be acknowledged uh, in the arena that she has played in for the last 14, 15 years. Um, Smither, you mm. spent a lot of time uh, working uh, on the women's game. How did you feel when you saw these changes uh, that New Zealand cricket had made? Well, it wasn't unexpected that they would do something. I mean, they had to. We were languishing in fifth. We didn't make the playoffs, and, and we blew a, a number of opportunities, which tends to suggest we weren't going about it the right way at critical points, doesn't it? 
Uh, so, the, you know, as a result of that, there, there were probably warranted to be some changes. How they went about making them, though, is quite interesting to me, Laura, because to my understanding, um, even though um, uh, there may well be a coach appointed, we don't know who it is. And I know for a fact, I interviewed Brian Stronach on the radio, and he told me who the selection panel process was. Uh, a part of that process was for uh, contracts, and the new coach was not part of that, as far as he was concerned to me. So whoever's coming in as the new coach, uh, he or she, and I think it's a he and I think it's an overseas he, I'm just saying, um, mm-hmm. I, I, I've got a feeling that uh, they might look at that squad and say, really? I wouldn't have minded, while I'm getting set in this job, I wouldn't have minded Amy Satterthwaite's experience at number four. Uh, I, I know she wasn't brilliant in the World Cup, but hell, how good was Susie Bates? I mean, was she great? And how often did Mealy Kerr throw it away in good situations? I mean, there are people within that group there who uh, might just be thinking, well, if Amy's gone, I might be just a little bit lucky uh, to be holding my place if they're, they're cleaning out some stuff. I, I would be thinking, don't write off the possibility of Amy Satterthwaite and Leah Tahuhu being back in the fold. Not sure about dear old Frankie. Um, I think I probably would have had Frankie for the Commonwealth Games. Uh, because Frankie was probably, when it came to the crunch, one of the better players in the World Cup in tight situations. So new coach coming in, uh, I, I would be really interested under, uh, to think what Hess thinks about coming into a job where you don't have a say what t- kind of tools you're using uh, to, to perform that job that's been done for you. Yeah, look, I think there's a few different points to that. I mean, firstly, um, look, New Zealand at the moment, with all of those stars that we talked about, all of those players we've talked about, we know the last few years that the, the results have been underwhelming and that's with our best players. So we're now heading into a Commonwealth Games and if, if you're taking over as coach, you would you would want all of your best resources available and then be able to make your own decision, you would think. And I know the contracting system is a little bit different to selection, but it certainly gives an indication of where the selectors are thinking at the time. So if you're all of a sudden going, we're now going to remove not only those three, we're going to remove five players who have, who have been part of last year's programme and with all due respect, the players that have been picked are really promising. So they're promising, and they're, some of them are exciting talents. Um, I know Eden Carson, I've seen her bowl, she, you know, good off spinner, um, really promising player. But I think we would be kidding if we thought that our performances would improve over the next 12 to 24 months while those players become used to international cricket. So there is a reality that... And, and it's brave from New Zealand cricket to go, yep, we're, what's happened the last few years is not acceptable. Um, we're not happy with it. These, these players are being left out um, for whatever reason. Um, you know, they don't suit the T20 model. We think these, uh, these other players are more promising given time. You know, I'm not privy to those discussions. But it is a very brave move with, as I said, the Commonwealth Games coming up, um, other world, world events in the next 24 months to think that these players that are getting contracts are going to just slide in um, because they haven't even done that domestically yet. Let's let's be honest, that the performances domestically of the new contracted players are promising at best. And so therefore, as I said, it's we actually need to allow them time to fail. And at the moment, as White Ferns fans, um, that's a bit of a struggle heading into a Commonwealth Games where we will still expect to be competing for a medal without some of our better performed players. So... Yeah, if I was coach, um, and I would certainly want to have a say over the the, the contracting list. Um, so if he hasn't, um, yeah, I'd be pretty disappointed. Or yeah, I'd be pretty pretty disappointing to to know that I've disengaged uh, two, three, four, or maybe even more of my top twenty players. Absolutely. Gentlemen, I want to thank you so much for your time today. Mike Hess and Ian Smith. Hess, you can go and get some sleep now. Smithy, we'll see you soon. Enjoy the cricket and we will see you next time on the Smith and Hesson podcast.